All righty. Well, I will reiterate for the record <laughs> that I am very pleased to have been invited here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I was also given a very strategic time slot uh, because since it's right after lunch, everyone can just sleep peacefully through the talk <laughs> and not allow it to disturb you in any way. Um, so this is work I did with my postdoc, Sheng Shi Pong, only it's more correct to say he did it with, with me. Uh, so really, um, uh, having Sheng Shi as a postdoc, he comes every week into my office and says, I was thinking about this, and then this turns into some paper, which is very, very pleasant for, for me. Um, <laughs> so so th this work is based on his ideas and, and largely his work with a little input from me. Uh, we agreed I would give the talk for, for no particularly good reason, but uh, I hope he'll, if there's discussion, I hope he'll, he'll uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, so we're talking about using uh, post-selection to improve the signal-to-noise ratio or improve the precision with which we're measuring some weak parameter. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be talking about comparing uh, a protocol where a weak interaction is followed by a uh, post-selected measurement on the system and not just a measurement on the probe versus the case where we're measuring just the probe and looking at its displacement. Um, so, the question of whether or not we can improve or even keep the measurement precision the same is not 100% obvious. Uh, the post-selection gives us some additional information. Uh, we're, we're, it's an additional conduit of information out of the joint system of the, the system in the probe. Uh, but of course, you throw away a lot of events, as has been discussed already <laughs> quite a bit this morning. Um, so, how do these two effects balance each other at the end of the day? Uh, and what we're going to show is that uh, not only can you concentrate the same amount of information into a smaller number of events, in some cases you can actually get more. You can actually increase the precision so that you're, you're, you're getting more benefit from doing the extra measurement than you lose from discarding uh, the, the, the events that are selected out. Uh, if there's a little time, I'll talk at the end about uh, another problem, which is not strictly the same thing, but I think people here would find interesting, about estimating a general <laughs> parameter, not just a multiplicative parameter. But, but uh, I don't know if there'll be time for that or not. Um, okay, so here's an outline of the talk. Um, I'll give some introduction. Uh, I'll talk about the problem of uh, choosing the optimal weak uh, measurement for, uh, for determining the, the given parameter, where we're optimizing more or less over the choice of system state and measurement. Um, and then uh, talk about specifically the signal to noise ratio and how that's affected by the choice of state, not only for the system, but for the probe as well. Um, and what we'll see here is that uh, if you allow the state of the probe to be a non-classical state in, in a fairly standard sense, you can actually <laughs> go beyond the signal-to-noise ratio you would get in the non-post-selected case. Uh, then we'll look at a different measure. Instead of signal-to-noise uh, ratio, we'll look at uh, Fisher information. Uh, and then if there's time at the end, I'll talk about this secondary subject very briefly. Okay, so the setup is one that we've already seen in various, uh, uh, at various points. We have an interaction Hamiltonian between what I'll call the system and the pointer or the probe or the meter. I'm standing in your way no matter what I do. Um, and uh, the, uh, the interaction Hamiltonian has this tensor product form. So there's some Hermitian operator omega that acts on the probe. Uh, and then there's some arbitrary observable A that acts on the system. And, of course, G is being multiplicative. I could absorb that into A if I choose. But it's handy to keep it as a separate parameter. This is sort of an overall scale that we're trying to determine. Um, the initial state of the system is some state psi i, and we're going to post-select it in some other state psi f. Uh, and the initial state of the pointer is D. 
Uh, and after a successful post-selection, the state, the final state of the pointer is this DF. So note this is not a normalized uh, state because generally speaking, uh, phi f and phi i have a small overlap with each other, which is where we get our amplification effect from. Um, okay, so having in some sense carried this out and with a su successful post-selection, what have we done? We have prepared this new state of the pointer df and then we measure some observable m on this pointer. So the, uh, the uh, expectation value of m would be uh, given by this expression where we're renormalizing and then we can look at the, uh, uh, the, the change in m due to the interaction delta m. Okay. So if g is very small, uh, which is this linear response regime that Justin was talking about before, then we can expand this uh, exponential function. So that requires that, uh, well, as we'll see, uh, if, if we do that, we end up with an expression that looks like this. And you see here the weak value appears, which has already been defined a bunch of times. Obviously, to be in this linear regime, even though AW itself may be large because of being divided by a relatively small number, um, but this uh, GAW omega has to be small. Uh, otherwise, you're not really in the linear regime. Okay. If you go beyond that, again, as Justin said, you can do further corrections. And Sheng Chi did a very lovely piece of work where he used a variational method to figure out what the maximum amplification you can get is. So that's a, I won't talk about that, but it's well worth looking into. Um, so, but as a general rule, if, if phi f and phi i are almost orthogonal, then you can make a w large and you get the weak, uh, weak value amplification effect. Okay. Um, so, what's the probability of the post-selection succeeding? So you can just use the usual Born rule. And uh, you get an expression that looks like this. Uh, if, you um, if you fix the weak value, so different <laughs> choices of initial and final state can give you the same weak value. So if you fix the weak value and then vary over all of the states that give you that weak value, you can maximize the probability of a successful post-selection and you get an expression that looks like this. And I think this is a very interesting uh, expression in a number of ways. Um, in particular, on the top is the, the, the variance of the observable A that acts on the system. But this thing on the bottom, which may not be entirely obvious just looking at it, also has the form of a variance. So if you, the, the variance here is obviously um, A minus the expectation of A uh, squared and then taking the expectation of that. On the bottom, if we substitute the weak value AW for the expectation of A, we get uh, precisely this expression down here. So since uh, this will always be positive and will uh, always be larger than the variance of A, this probability will be less than one, which is a comforting thing in a probability. Um, so, so one type of uh, optimization we can do is this. We fix a particular level of amplification that we want to achieve, staying in the linear regime, and then we try to maximize the probability of success. Obviously, the more uh, successful post-selection is the more information you get about the parameter G. Um, alternatively, we can fix the post-selection probability and instead try to maximize the amplification and do a very similar kind of uh, argument so we're really just interested in maximizing the size of the amplification. And if we do that, what we get is we get the expectation of A uh, at plus some uh, additional piece that depends on the success probability. So if the success probability is small, then this number becomes large. <laughs> so it's the same trade-off that we've seen before uh, by making the post-selection probability smaller, we can make the amplification larger and vice versa. Okay. All right. So now that we have the basic uh, 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 parameters of our scheme laid out, 
uh, what we're going to look at is the signal to noise ratio. So the signal to noise ratio uh, is given by the following. Uh, given a particular post selection probability P, and given that we have repeated this entire protocol n times, uh, the signal to noise ratio taking all of those, uh, the results of all of those n runs is proportional to the square root of n times ps, which is just the number of successful events on average, uh, times the, uh, the average deviation of the observable m in the uh, final state, divided by the variance of m in the final state. So this f is, uh, is df that we wrote down before. Um, OK. Um, since the... Uh, uh, since the size of this uh, scales like the inverse square root of uh, P, so that comes from uh, here, um, and here, uh, the question is, there's a square root of P on the bottom and there's a square root of P on the top. So do we actually get any net benefit from doing this? Now, we've already seen that you can, uh, I mean, as people have pointed out earlier this morning, you can keep the signal to noise ratio roughly the same. So you're in some sense throwing away a lot of the events, but each of the events that you're keeping uh, contains more information and has a larger signal. So these two effects roughly cancel out. But uh, of course, there's also a, a somewhat complicated dependence on the particular choice of states for the system and the choice of the observable M that you measure on the probe um, and we'll also the choice of state on the probe. So we'll, we'll get into these uh, shortly. So is there some room in those choices to get an improvement over uh, what you could do if you don't do a measurement on the system at all? Okay, so let's uh, expand this out a bit. So what do we have? We have this delta M up here and the variance of M down here. So the signal to noise ratio is proportional to G. Um, we have the N dependence up here. Uh, and then we have this rather complicated expression here, which is, uh, uh, which I think has, a, again, an interesting structure. So I just want to point out, there's a term here which is proportional to the imaginary part of the weak value. And this thing in here looks like the covariance of the observable M that we're measuring and the Hamiltonian omega that acts on, on the system. Okay. So, so that's an interesting uh, object. And then we have another piece here multiplied by the real part of the weak value, which is uh, related to the commutator of omega with m. Now, we want this commutator to be non-zero because if the commutator, uh, if omega commutes with m, then in general we would not expect this interaction to change the value of m, and therefore we don't see anything. Okay. Um, and then on the bottom here we have this same uh, expression that that we had that showed up in the optimal uh, success probability. Now, we need, uh, we have set this up where we have uh, optimized for a fixed value of um, a, uh, AW, of the weak value. And now we would like to uh, optimize this expression, maximize this over all possible weak values within the, the linear response. So since AW is complex, we can write it in polar form like this and then separately optimize this expression uh, over the amplitude of A and the phase. So let's do that one step at a time. Um, if we do the maximization over, uh, over AW and then over, um, over the phase theta, we end up with an expression that looks like this. 
So again, we have our covariance looking term here and we have our commutator there. So there's a bit of a trade-off between those. Uh, and then the variance of M in the original state, D. Okay. Um, now, the, th uh, the important stuff shows up out here. So this is the stuff that's under our control. Um, everything here just now depends on the original state of the pointer. So at the moment, we're not optimizing over that. Um, all of the dependence on the weak value, which is the dependence on the choice of the system state and, and the post selection, is in this function, uh, uh, eta of phi. So phi is an angle, which is just the, uh, the, the phase of, uh, so this is the imaginary part uh, up, up here, of, uh, the, the coefficient of the imaginary part, and this is the coefficient of the real part. So this is the phase corresponding to that. And then this function eta, sorry? Is there actually an I on top there? Um, is there an I? Yes, because this is a commutator. So, so you need the I to make it a uh, Hermitian. Um, yeah. Uh, and then this is a, is a function of phi, which boils down to uh, something that doesn't look too bad if you ignore the fact that this phi is an enormously complicated expression. Um, okay, uh, but we, we've uh, really, at this point, um, uh, everything now just depends on the choice of state uh, D, the choice of initial state for the probe. We've, for a fixed pointer state D, we've now optimized over our choices of the system state and the, and the, the initial state of the system, uh, sorry, of the initial state and the final state of the system. So the, the pre and post selection. Okay. So that's the the case, the set, uh, signal to noise ratio when we're doing weak measurement with post selection on the system. What if we do no post selection? So to be clear, when I say no post selection, I mean we're we're not measuring the system. After the interaction, we throw the system away and we just measure the probe. Um, in that case, you get a much simpler expression for the signal-to-noise ratio, uh, which again involves the commutator of omega and m. So again, if, the, if they commute, you don't see anything. Um, but it's proportional to the expected value of this uh, observable A in the interaction Hamiltonian in the initial state of, uh, of the system. So it's quite clear how to maximize this. The only thing that we can optimize is this expectation value. And clearly, the, the maximum value you can get for that uh, corresponds to the largest eigenvalue of that observable A. Largest in magnitude. We don't care if it's positive or negative. Um, all we want is a big shift. So then the maximum signal-to-noise ratio you can get uh, without post-selection uh, is given by this expression here. So you have a variance of m in both of these. So now we'll take the ratio of the two ratios. So it's a ratio to a higher order. I don't know. It's just a ratio. So the, the variance cancels out. Uh, and what you get is uh, on the bottom, you get the maximum eigenvalue of a, which is more or less the, the, uh, the, the the magnification you get by your choice of the uh, state uh, of the system in the case with no post selection. And you get uh, this expression, which is the uh, eta of phi uh, in, the, in the case with post selection. So then the question is, is this ratio greater than one? Um, well, if you look at this quantity, you see that it involves a cosecant here. And the cosecant squared must be greater than or equal to 1. So, and, and then there's a relationship between uh, the maximum eigenvalue and the maximum value of the uh, uh, expectation of A. So, 
this combination up here has to be greater than that. And so if we let the initial state of phi i go to the state which maximizes this eigenvalue, then this ratio will always be greater than or equal to 1. So in that case, we always do at least as well with post-selection as we do without post-selection. So you don't lose anything, which is, which is a good thing to begin with. Um, but can we actually do better? Well, to do better, we need this, this cosecant actually to be greater than 1. Um, and of course, cosecants are greater than 1 for almost all values uh, of phi. But um, in order to affect that, we need to uh, look at the, the choice of the pointer's initial state. So, so far we've assumed that the state of the pointer is fixed. It's this initial state D. Now, there's a, a relatively natural reason to, uh, to think that uh, we have much more ability to optimize the state of the system than the state of the pointer. The system, in the description that we've described, uh, that we've been discussing here, uh, is a finite dimensional system. Uh, we, it could be, for instance, just a single spin. Uh, we have a much greater ability to prepare an arbitrary state of such a system and to me do an arbitrary measurement on it afterwards. The pointer, by contrast, is a continuous variable. It's, for instance, uh, a particle position, a mode of a, uh, of a field or something like that. Um, and our ability to prepare an arbitrary state of that is much more limited. Nevertheless, we do have some ability to prepare different states and do different kinds of measures. So now we uh, want to optimize this choice of state within some range of uh, reasonable possibilities in order to maximize uh, this ratio here, make it greater than 1. So since D is a continuous um, degree of freedom, uh, we switch to a Fox space based description. So uh, we assume that uh, uh, our omega and our m are some natural uh, observables for a continuous function. Since we need them to uh, not commute with each other, a natural choice is to have one of them be q and the other one be p. So we actually, in this case, chose omega to be q, so that's in the interaction, and m to be p, which is actually the opposite of what people usually do. Um, but I think it makes sense. Uh, interactions are more often local than they are, uh, so based on position, than they are based on momentum. Um, and of course, a shift in momentum can be detected as a shift in position after a time. So it's a natural enough thing. The interaction, which is considered to be just an impulse uh, we'll give a momentum kick to the, to the probe. After waiting a little while, we can look at the, po uh, at, at the position of the probe and estimate what the momentum kick was. Okay. So if we write Q and P in terms of the uh, creation and annihilation operators, uh, we can then find an expression for this cosecant squared of phi. So remember how phi was defined here. So now uh, omega and M are Q and P. So this is just the commutator of Q and P, which is I. Uh, and then we have the, the covariance of Q and P down on the bottom here. And after a little algebra, you end up with an expression like this. So remember, 1 is the minimum uh, value that this cosecant squared can take. And then, of course, you add some positive number to it, which depends on the expectations of the creation and annihilation operators in this square. Uh, so, for what kinds of states is this quantity going to be greater than 1? Well, the state that we consider to be the kind of most natural state, easiest to prepare for such a system, would be a coherent state. But in a coherent state, um, these expectations will exactly cancel out. So in a coherent state, uh, the expectations of these will be the same and of these uh, and everything will, uh, sorry, the expectation of the, 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 the squares is the same as the squares of the expectations. So uh, 
these terms will cancel with these terms, and you're left with your cosecant squared equal to 1. So with a normal coherent state, your signal-to-noise ratio is exactly the same <coughs> as in the non-post-selected case. So you don't do any worse, but you don't do any better either. But this is for a coherent state. What about for more general states? Well, a natural next thing to try would be the next uh, generalization beyond the standard coherent state, and that would be a squeezed coherent state. So for a squeezed coherent state, we assume the pointer state D uh, is a coherent state with the squeezing operator applied to it. Uh, the actual value of this alpha is completely unimportant. We can take it to be zero if we like. So this could be the squeeze vacuum, for example. Um, if we plug this into the expression for the cosecant of uh, cosecant squared of phi, we get that the cosecant squared of phi is 1 plus a quantity that depends on the parameters of, of this squeezing, uh, depends on the value of the squeezing parameter. So R is the amplitude of squeezing in, in theta is the phase, and the, uh, the improvement in the F and R depends on both of those. So if R is greater than zero and uh, you choose theta so that the sign is non-vanishing, then you end up with the cosecant square being greater than one and the, the, you get an improvement in the S and R. So post-selection can actually not only match the S and R of the non-post-selected uh, uh, protocol, it can actually improve over it, but only in a certain sense with the assistance of non-classicality. That is, the pointer state has to be chosen to be a squeezed state, a non-classical state. Uh, if you use just an ordinary laser mode, for example, you won't, you'll, you'll, you'll see the same S and R that you would without post selection. Just to clarify, yes. Um, Yes. So let, let me say it again, and, and I'll try to say it precisely. Um, using uh, post-selected weak, weak measurement, um, we enhance the signal for all of the successfully post-selected events, but we have fewer of them because our post-selection probability is less than one. And in an ordinary coherent state, these two effects exactly cancel out. So the total signal that we get is exactly the same as if we hadn't done post-selection at all, but the information, in a sense, is squeezed into a smaller number of events. If we use, instead, a squeezed coherent state for the pointer's initial state, we can go beyond that. And the additional signal we get in the amplification will actually be larger than the um, uh, than what we lose due to the post-selection. Yes. Um, I think not much. Did you did you look at anything beyond squeeze states, Shangxi? No. Um, yeah. So there there is an issue, which is, of course. Uh, the reason to look at coherent states and squeeze coherent states is we have a good idea, whereby we, I mean not me personally, but people who, who actually do these things, how to prepare them, right? So you could actually, you know, uh, do this in the lab using known techniques. Um, with, you know, with spin systems, we have a fair idea how to prepare more or less an arbitrary state by applying various unitaries to it, the kind of circuit model uh, paradigm, but for continuous states, not so much. But, you know, there are other things one could look at. I, d I don't know, um, you know, number states or whatever. You, you need very specific kinds of, uh, of systems in order to do that. I do not mind. How are we doing on top? Two slides. Two slides is like one slide, only twice as All right. 
So, so basically, um, if you combine these things together, what you get is the variance of the um, annihilation operator, which vanishes in coherent states, but not in squeeze states. All right. Okay. So here's a little plot, which I think is, is very, very cute. Um, this is this quantity S, uh, not the absolute value of it. So we have both positive and negative numbers here. Um, versus this uh, squeezing parameter C. So R is the radius out and phi is, is the angle around here. Uh, and what you can see is that as you go away from zero, so you, you move into the regime of strong squeezing, there are regimes where you can get a, a very large improvement in the signal to noise ratio. So this is, this is an absolute scale, right? So it's 25 <coughs> times as great. That's right. So 25 times as great or minus 25 times as great, um, which, is, which is not to be sneezed at. Uh, admittedly, you know, you're moving up. Uh, so how big is R here? You have to put the. Uh, how big is R? Yeah. Uh, it, it is 2. So this is R equals 2 is the boundary here? Right? Yes. Yeah. The radius. Right. So, you know, squeeze but not squeeze to an insane degree. Um, okay. Uh, now, another way of quantifying the possible advantage we might have is with the Fisher information. So signal to noise ratio is one particular measure. Um, another way is with the Fisher information, which has already been introduced. Uh, one way of thinking about this is if you introduce a metric in, in the state space, um, this measures how steeply you move away as you change the parameter g uh, from your initial state. So um, for a post-selected weak measurement, uh, the final uh, pointer state depends on G in, in this way. So um, you can plug that into this expression for the Fisher information, and you get an expression that looks like this. Uh, so PS, again, is the probability of successful post-selection. AW is the weak value. Uh, and then uh, omega is the Hamiltonian that acts on the pointer. Um, if you don't post select, then the dependence, uh, instead of having a w up here, you have the expectation value of a. Um, and so you end up with the Fisher information like this. Very similar looking expression, just with that change between the, ver um, between the expectations squared and the uh, weak value squared. Um, so if you look at the ratio of the two Fisher informations, you can see that it also is greater than or equal to 1, so you'll never do worse by doing this post-selection if you do it properly, uh, optimizing in, in the right way. Um, and uh, so this shows that uh, using Fisher information as well, you also can get an improvement. Um, now, I will address one more point that has been raised earlier this morning. Um, of course, the events that we throw away also, in principle, contain a certain amount of information about G. So by including them, we could improve the precision of our measurement uh, even more and boost, or in this case, boost the Fisher information by a little bit. But as it happens, uh, not by a great deal. So as, as Justin indicated before, um, the Fisher information you get with post-selection, uh, where you just throw away the failed uh, events uh, is strictly less than what you would get if you kept everything, but in, in fact the difference is, is small. Uh, now I should also point something else out, which I haven't seen addressed at any great length. In fact, the optimal way of getting information about G out of this system would be to prepare the system in the probe in a general initial state, which could be entangled, have, them in, have the interaction happen and then do a general joint measurement on the two of them. So what the optimal performance in that way would be, I have no idea. Um, those kinds of things are not very, not very easy to do. Doing general joint measurements uh, is, is tricky. 
uh, in finite dimensional systems, we, we have a decent idea how to do it, assuming we have a universal set of quantum gates, for example. Uh, for continuous probe systems like we're considering here, uh, honestly, I have no idea. But in principle, that would be the best thing that you could do. So there would be a sort of F joint, which would, which would be even greater than that. And how much we're falling short of that, I don't know. Um, okay, how much time? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Well, okay, I'll just say something very brief. Uh, this, is, this is not with post-election, but it still, I think, would be of interest to this crowd. Um, we basically, we were just considering a case when the interaction Hamiltonian, rather than being G times some uh, product operator, is a general Ham Hamiltonian that can depend on G in a general way. Um, so we have some unitary that acts for a time uh, where HG acts for a time T. Uh, and we can identify an operator called little h of G, which is the generator of translations with respect to the parameter G. So if you um, uh, 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 apply this, the effect of that is the same as if you shifted the value of G by an infinitesimal amount. Um, so using this general paradigm, you can again write down uh, an expression for the, uh, the Fisher information, um, which will depend on the change in this this quantity hg uh, in your initial state psi. And you would maximize, uh, sorry, it's the, the variance in hg in your initial state psi. Sorry. Um, and uh, if you want to maximize this, the optimal choice would be to prepare psi in an equally weighted superposition of the eigenstates uh, of hg with maximum and minimum eigenvalues. So basically, so the difference between them is as large as possible. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about, so, so this expression is very general, but evaluating this can be quite complicated if the dependence is complicated. Um, but the general principle here is uh, we can look at cases where not just the eigenvalues of the interaction, but the eigenvectors also depend on G. And what we see is something that happens rather differently than in the usual case. Uh, consider, for example, where we're trying to determine the direction of a magnetic field. We do that by putting a spin one half in the field and looking at how it recesses. Okay. So here, the parameter that we're trying to estimate is the angle of theta at which the field is pointing. Uh, and the strength of the interaction does not depend on theta. Okay. Um, so if you go through this rigmarole and you ask what the Fisher information is, what you find is it actually, rather than growing steadily with time, as is, happens in the multiplicative case, it actually <laughs> oscillates. So if you look at the spin at the right time, it will have rotated by the maximum amount, and you get the most information you can about the direction of the field. If you miss that and wait too long, it will actually keep recessing back, and you will, you will learn less. So you have to time it exactly right to get the maximum amount of information, and the maximum amount of information is fixed. So it doesn't grow without limit. So to figure out the direction, you would have to, you can't just put a single spin there and, and let it interact for a long time. You would actually have to do multiple measurements with multiple spins if you want to boost your information. Um, okay, so to sum up, um, using measurement of the system and post-selection, we can get Im additional information, the information we acquire in some sense from the outcome of the, the system measurement, um, but at the cost of discarding some results because we're only keeping the ones that were post-selected. Uh, so if we look at how these two effects um, uh, balance out, what we find is that for a coherent state, they exactly balance. So the information we gain on the one hand is equal to the information we lose on the other, and the signal-to-noise ratio is unchanged. But if we can prepare our pointer in a non-classical state, we can gain more information than we lose, and so we can improve the SNR. And in fact, it can be improved by quite a significant amount. Um, 
if we look at the same problem in terms of the fissure information, uh, the same thing happens. We can increase the fissure information by using the non particle state, for example. Um, and the loss of information in, in the events that we're discarding can be made small. Um, and then last point, I, I just mentioned something completely unrelated about generalizing this general type of problem to the case where the interaction Hamiltonian depends on the parameter G in a general way, not just as a multiplicative constant. So thank you very much for your attention. I just want to say, first of all, that I, I really like that treatment. I think it's a, a very important contribution to the, the field. Uh, I'm a little confused about the particular comparison of the coherent state and the squeeze state. Uh, I probably just missed something, but they're both Gaussian states. Yes. And unless you're actually sitting in a harmonic oscillator or Hamiltonian for the probe, which I didn't think you assumed, what's to define which state is coherent and which one is squeezed? It's just a scale factor. Well, in a sense. Um, but well, what sets the scale, <laughs> I guess, is, is my question. Um, okay, so if we go back here, uh, what we're really starting with is a Q and a P. So there's some natural scale of these objects. So um, it's true that by changing my units, I can, I can uh, alter the constants that go into the way these things are defined. But um, So I give you a Gaussian state of you know, a one-dimensional object uh, with a free Hamiltonian. And I, I guess my question is, what width of Gaussian would you call squeezed and what width would you call coherent? Well, that relationship uh, more or less com comes into this, right? Where I assumed that omega was Q and M was P, right? So that we had the, the canonical computation <laughs> relationships between them. So if I do a rescaling, that's going to rescale this, which will rescale um, the, the signal to noise uh, ratio. So I think by playing the game, so the answer is there, you know, there, indeed what I'm calling squeeze and what I'm calling a standard coherent state <coughs> is, is kind of arbitrary. Um, but I mean, I could always just. a problem, there's a natural, uh, there, there's presumably a natural set, set of units. But, you know. Is there a difference between, I mean, sorry, o omega is the one that shows up in the interaction Hamiltonian multiplied right. by G. So replacing G with G on 2 and replacing omega with 2 omega doesn't change anything physical. That's correct. And yet it changes which state you say can give you an SNR advantage. Um, well, I think that change should just cancel out, right? So That's what doing hoped. that rescaling <laughs> will change the definition of the, uh, the uh, let's see. So doing that rescaling, you'd rescale M. And so you'd have to rescale M as well in order to get the same um, commutation relation. And then the effect would, would cancel out. But, you know, I, I mean, I must admit, I haven't sat down and, and worked through that. Xing Chi, have you considered that? I think that, that if we rescale Q, QRP, then actually you will, uh, you will rescale the, the square of the, of the absolute value in equation 19. So actually uh, the, conclu the conclusion will, be, will still be the same. That is, for a coherent state, then uh, that, in, that in square will still be, uh, be zero. And uh, for a squeezed state, it will be larger than zero. Yeah. yeah. In other words, you know, you, you have to rescale these in order to maintain that then the rescaling will percolate through. If we invert this relationship to see how mm -hmm. we're defining a dagger in A in terms of Q and P, um, the, the rescalings that we get there will... will yeah, because you, will you seem to be saying that if you let Q go to 2Q and P go to P over 2, uh, it doesn't change anything, but that's exactly the squeezing transformation, right? That, that's how you go from a squeeze state to a coherent state or... Um, Yes, but we'll, I mean, that'll redefine, I, I mean, I don't know what, 
I don't know how to answer that exactly. You could say it like this. If you have a Gaussian state, uh, if you consider the family of all Gaussian states, then there is a state which gives you the minimum ratio of these S and R, which in this way of parameterizing everything corresponds to the standard coherent state. Okay. And every other and and other Gaussian states will be related to that in a way that will increase the S and R. Right. So so there is some uh, Gaussian state which gives you the minimum of this ratio and then uh, other Gaussian st states will, will uh, increase the ratio. Well, if that's right, then as long as you're not talking about the electromagnetic field where coherent states are truly natural, you have a situation where you'd have to be incredibly unlucky to not win because there'd be one particular Gaussian state out there that doesn't help you and everything else would just automatically be good. Um, everything will be better than one, but won't necessarily be enormously better than one. There, there's, there's some sort of area around that state where they'll all be better than one, but not necessarily by a great deal. Um, so you need to be a little ways away from that state. But, but indeed, I mean, yeah, uh, they're all Gaussian states. Uh, the thing that you can't do, which is maybe why I, I, so my answer was not very coherent, pardon the pun, but um, the... Um, you know, obviously, if you just change your scale, you can give a specious improvement of precision. You know, if I if I change my units to you know from uh, you know from from centimeters to pico miles um, or or something like that, you know. So uh, you know, I can make the numbers change, but of course, I'm not really. Yeah. Really and, and I want to say that if you rescale T or P, actually you will rescale the value of the um, for the person uh, for the person selected measurement, weak measurement, and the non person selected weak measurement, uh, weak measurement uh, simultaneously. Yeah. So actually, that will uh, cancel the effect of the rescale, in some sense. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Actually, you can. So if you look at the expression. Uh, maybe I think maybe you have the variance here and here. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, of course, your point is well taken. For uh, for a general Gaussian state, there'll be one state which is <coughs> for the family of Gaussian states. There'll be one state where this ratio is the minimum, and the minimum will be one, and then all others will be large. And there will be particular directions of squeezing that will give you the, big, the biggest advantage, okay. as you can see in the picture. You're a lot better sort of in this direction than in this direction. Any more? Yes. So, so I have a, just a basic question about, if you look at the definition of Fisher of information, it says, I take a state and I, and I optimize over all possible basis transformations to find the maximum information uh, contained about the parameter in question, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is, look, I just take this system, it's a bipartite system, and I have some Fisher information about the entangled state, it's F. Now I just project on the system, and depending on you know, putting in some squeezing or something, suddenly I get something bigger than F, right? So the question is, where does that information come from? How is a projective measurement on the system able to create more information about the, the system, the, um, the parameter? So in both of these protocols, I'm measuring the, the observable M on the probe, okay? In the post-selected protocol, I am also measuring a second observable on the system. So indeed, I'm getting more information. So that's where it comes from, right? So if I choose... It, it, I mean, so in that sense, it's not surprising that you do better, right? I mean, you shouldn't ever do worse by getting an additional independent piece of information. So, so measuring the system doesn't, doesn't change the statistics of my measurement on the probe if I consider the whole ensemble. But, but is it, it gives me additional information. But isn't the Fisher information defined on, on both system and probe, though? 
it, it, it's a joint. It's a joint. It's a joint state, right? Um, in this case, let's see where is it. Um, it's the chain. Um, it's the change in the state of the pointer, right? So, in other words, this psi is not the joint state of the system and the uh, and the pointer. It's the post-selected state of the pointer I, uh, in the one case uh, versus the uh, the approximate state in the, in the other. So, so before you do any projections, after you let them entangle, if I compute the Fisher information of, of both, of the joint state, do I get another, another Fisher information that you haven't talked about? Um, that might well be the thing that I have mentioned at the end, which would be what you could get with, a, with an optimal joint measure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I think we should go on now.